Hey guys, what's up? Aru. With the recent drip marketing of Arlecchino finally being posted, as well as other things, I believe it's time to remind you guys how evil Harbingers are and how horrifying Arlecchino can and actually is. From her name itself being the Knave and Harlequin in the Commedia dell'Arte, her closer relations to the Devil as well as the possible betrayal of Columbina against Arlecchino, her possible origins through the drip marketing post as the perpetually cursed and purified sinner, the possibility of there being two Arlecchino Kinos roaming the world, finally the graceful facade that you, as well as what the House of the Hearth may think, versus the wolf in sheep's clothing that her co-workers really think about her. If you can even call these equally unstable individuals her co-workers. So all of that along with some theory and speculation on who, what, how, and why she's the way she is, hopefully I can help you at least think of how truly terrifying the fourth Harbinger actually is. As usual, timestamps below for you to pick a specific segment. Let's jump right in. For the prim, clean, and proper introduction, the albino Eula of Genshin Impact, Arlecchino, or better known as Dad, I mean Father, is the fourth harbinger of the Fatui with a steadfast and quite deadly duty to take care of her children of the House of Hearth, but also her unquestionable loyalty to serve the Archon of Snesnaya, the Saritsa. Arlecchino presents a demeanor of graceful, professional, and very friendly personality. A native Fontanian who cares for her homeland and would do all that she can to ensure the safety of not only her children, but for those that she cares for, whatever that is. But behind that cordial public personality is what many would call sheep's clothing. As we all know, actors in the theater have one thing that they are really good at, and that's mesmerizing the crowd and keeping their attention where it needs to be. Arlecchino's title is called The Dire Bail Moon, and her constellation is called Ignis Purgatorius. Now, Bail Moon isn't exactly a real name, but if translated from Chinese, it roughly means quote unquote lonely, dim, and ominous moon, which fits with the word dire, meaning a disaster or a threat, as well as the word bail or baleful, meaning destructive and harmful. The word dim simply means lack of light and can be related to a dark moon or the old waning crescent moon, which symbolizes the final phase of the old moon with light on its left side and a sign that a new moon will emerge with light on the right side, often symbolizing a new week or a new month from my understanding. So the lone, disastrous dark moon is the best way we can make sense of her original Chinese title, translating and then shortening it to Dire Bail Moon. Moons and disasters within the game we can sort of link to the three moon sisters, but those events paired with the little that we know about Arlecchino's past is hard to make connections with, unless we use references like the newest book, Perrin Harry, which is an allegorical tale about a legendary story in Hanria. I won't go too deep into the book because again it's allegorical and we can literally make 101 interpretations of it, but it did mention two dynasties of Conria, the Crimson Moon and the Black Sun Dynasty, which reflects both the lunar eclipse and the solar eclipse. Lunar eclipses are often red, and Perrin Harry experienced what can only be depicted as a change from a lunar eclipse to a solar eclipse. There's also mentions of an orphanage that takes in quote-unquote unusual orphans of the kingdom and so-called transcendental people, of which Perrin Harry, Leobrandt, and Angelica are all quote-unquote unusual and or transcendental people. Specifically, Angelica, who was the divine emissary, meaning Arlecchino could be someone who observed the real lunar and solar moon of the abyss and not the fake moon of Tevat. As for how she ended up in Conria, we can think of a similar event that happened with child. Falling down a crevice that leads to the abyss is similar to a child from a destroyed world crawling through a smokeless chimney and catching a glimpse of the two moons. If you're asking why the abyss and why Conria is related, well, Piero is from Conria, and we also have knowledge of the Fatui and Orsnajnaya having missions that include trips to the abyss from Wanderer. So a competent hearth member on a mission to go there is not a wild assumption for someone like Arlecchino. She might have even gained her abilities there just like Child did, but she may have learned it from Piero instead of Skirk. Moving on to our constellation Ignis Purgatorius, which roughly translates to purifying flame or literally 
purifiers of purgatory. Now, purgatory in Catholic religion is a place for souls who undergo a purification process or purifying flames for as long as they need to until they are allowed entry into heaven. But from my understanding, there isn't actually a physical place called purgatory, but there is an interim state or purgatorial state in which a person will remain in a period of purification before being admitted into heaven. Putting this into Genshin's perspective, Arlecchino is either the priest or quote-unquote father that absolves sins or she herself is in a purifying interim state between death and being sent to heaven. Now, the only purifying flame we can see from the Harbingers is this hand holding a small flame, just like the flickering flame of the hearth in her drip marketing when they start their missions. As for the hand, well, we probably already know whose hands those are, which points to the oh-so-lovely theory of Arlecchino being a hilly churl. But instead of a relation to Caterpillar or Carter Sherbius being transferred to an already existing hilly churl, Arlecchino could be a special case of a half Conrian that experienced an incomplete hilly churl transformation. Hilly churls were no longer human and were going through a different form of erosion instead of death based on Dane's lift. And hilly churls were the cursed half Conrians as well as those who left their previous gods as a form of quote unquote punishment. But maybe this wasn't just a mere punishment, but also a form of purification. Erosion includes memory loss, emotional loss, recalling traumatic events, loss of self, loss of consciousness, irritability, as well as anger management issues. All of these side effects seem to be present in Arlecchino to a certain degree when you think about how much she lies and is near emotionless most of the time, as well as hallucinating past experiences in her drip marketing. And when she does get mad, well, Poof. Now the hilly churls in the chasm were in a weak state that's nearing the end of their existence. And even though they hate light, maybe this is when they have actually accepted their sins. Accepting the warmth of the light near their purification at the end of their existence. The entirety of Fontaine is also focused on sins and sinners, while the book Perrin Harry highlights going through a quote-unquote chimney and then being pronounced dead before being allowed through the final exit. Perrin Harry, a drifter between worlds who did not bear a curse, pretended to be dead, in our case purified, because of his fear, and he caught a glimpse of the transition between two eclipses, as well as traversing the fires of the two worlds in the hearth or in this case, the purgatory of both worlds. Perrin Harry as a child would also have no god that she puts her faith into, a child from a destroyed world that drifted into the kingdom, likely Conria, and then receiving an incomplete or altered curse of being half Conrian and being someone from a different world that just for some reason ended up there. So putting this into perspective, Arlecchino could be in a perpetual interim state of purgatory or purification, hence her sanity being mildly intact and looking the way she is, as well as everything she does. But that's simply basing it off of an allegorical tale of a legendary story from a fallen kingdom. Those are three levels of ways you can mess up a story. But the Arlecchino here and the Knave from the Harbinger Circle may not even be the same Arlecchino that we've been meeting with. And a theory that there are two Arlecchinos is also related to a certain Comedia that references all the Harbingers. But first, let's talk about the previous Knave. Moving on to the more known lore of Arlecchino as well as the place that she runs called the House of Hearth. She seems to not be the actual knave of the hearth that we know, and it was mentioned by Efim Snezhnevich after being quote-unquote persuaded by Inazuma's spy group that the knave had a clash with a certain child of the hearth which led to the replacement of the knave, which then leads to how Arlecchino runs the hearth purely composed of children compared to the old knave, which has sleeper agent contacts all over to that. The previous knave was a pretty bad character, blackmailing others, using searingly painful punishments for failure and overall just a bad person. The word searingly is interesting since even though Arlecchino is said to have replaced the previous knave, she also possesses a pyro vision. Bear in mind that this information on the previous knave and new knave is from an allegedly interrogated Fatui hearth member. And we all know how sly and sharp the Fatui members speak, let alone a hearth member. 
this sort of creates a contrast between the now Hearth of Hearth orphanage for children and the older House of Hearth that only picks out those with quote-unquote potential and then assigning them as sleeper agent members scattered throughout the Fatui organization. I'll let your imagination decide what happens with those without potential. While we know that Arlecchino replaced the previous knave, we still don't know if the previous knave is alive or not, which begs the question, are there two knaves in Tavat? And we can also get why the Fatui and the Hearth create and recruit members from orphans. I know it sounds bad and evil, but it's very easy to create and find orphans in the game. And it's also very easy to manipulate children into thinking family is where the hearth is. I mean, just listen to the terrifying cult-like statement that Arlecchino gave to Linny. But similarly, the current House of Hearth is an equally strict yet lenient group of spy kids. We can see the urgency of failure from Lenny and Lynette as well as Fremenay when they failed to infiltrate the fortress of Meropede. But we can also notice Arlecchino's mercy when she saved Lenny and Lynette from a weird old man who kept children in his basement, saving them in a difficult mission right after they gained their visions, and when she told the truth of Fremenay's mother, which is found in the Archon quest as well as their character story. However, there's a strange robotic or near puppet-like situation within the House of Hearth that we can find from her recent drip marketing post, in which she was hallucinating about her memories of becoming a harbinger and then snapping back to reality within the Hearth's halls. And while the children within these hearths seem like an ordinary happy family in the orphanage, the clock chimes and the bell tolls. Very quiet and very unified to listen and do the bidding of their father, instantly set on their missions as the members of the Fatui's young spy network. This is the new House of Hearth that Arlecchino runs. With any and all of the Harbingers, we are bound to talk about everyone's favorite reference. Everything about Arlecchino's character within the Commedia is explained by the entirety of a Harlequin, a nimble and agile, light-hearted and astute servant that more often than not thwarts the plans of his master and competes with Pierrot, a stock character that plays the mischievous devil or demon. Right off the bat, you can see the weird conflict with what Arlecchino does in the play and what a Harlequin is known for. Being astute means to assess any situation, events, or even people and turn them all into their advantage which is highlighted by her own co-workers, Child and Wanderer, a wolf in sheep's clothing that hides her quote-unquote crazy side from the general public. And whoever sees her crazy side simply goes poof. Of which you can also notice this similar feeling of terror and failure from her own children of the heart. Now I don't know about you, but I don't mind seeing a bit or a lot of her crazy side in the next patch. Arlecchino and the Harlequin trope is usually associated with what is called the Zani, a sort of archetype within the Commedia symbolizing the comic servant, of which we can see from Arlecchino's deep loyalty to the Saritza, or does she? Child also says that if Arlecchino could benefit from betraying the Saritza, she would definitely do it in a heartbeat, and that there isn't a sane bone in her body. The Commedia also highlights Arlecchino often thwarting the plans of Pierrot as well as being a servant of Pantalone. Not only that, Arlecchino is also very superficial and fickle, often playing both sides and usually betraying the Vecchios in favor of his quote-unquote love interests. Finally, his Inamorati, or love interest with Columbina, which isn't exactly real. It's more of a lust than a love, so I guess that could explain all the fan art that we see. That and the fact that the Zani within the play serves to help with love interests but it's also planning their selfish ploys. In this case, feeding Arlecchino's hunger and lust. But because we're getting Arlecchino in 4.6, it's with enough reason that we would either see the Tori again or even better, a new Harbinger. And who better than Arlecchino's friend with benefit, Columbina. The other possible Harbingers that we might meet are Pantalone and Piero based off of the Commedia. But based on current lore about Arlecchino, it's also possible that we would know or maybe even see the previous Knave in 4.6, of which we have possible theoretical evidence of that happening as well. Interestingly, something about the different Zani in the Commedia is that Arlecchino has an older sibling called Brigella, which is basically the same person but is way smarter, way more vindictive, and way more deceitful and selfish. A masterful liar that can make up lies for any situation on the spot. So if you're looking for a twin Arlecchino theory, then this is your possible reference. 
Briella also wears a white smock and pants, and the overall design displays a very preternatural look of both lust and greed. Preternatural meaning between the natural and miraculous. Again, an interim state between death and purification. I mean, does this look natural? Or is this both an angel and a devil in the same person? I have no idea. The other Zani servants are Pedrolino, the first of the Zani, who is disguised as a magician, depicted as the social wit or the witty slave, which reflects Linny and the first great magic. Next is the escapist or Scapino, a clever servant who wears a green or turquoise costume, reflecting Lynette. I can't find anything on Fremine, but he seems to have his own thing going on. Anyway, this could be the reason why we have a previous knave and the current Arlecchino, with Ignis Purgatorio and Dire Bale Moon either being the two Zani siblings. One being a purifying knave that punishes any mistake that you make, and the other knave being in a constant state of purification, both very, very sly and deceitful, and doing things for their own benefit. So it's worth considering what some would see from the surface of what Arlecchino is doing. She's doing that for her own benefit and not for anyone else which would make you wonder if she cares not for the hearth or the twins or fremine does she care for poisson and navia what about fontaine even worse what about the saritsa and snezhnaya if everything that she so cared for on the surface is just a front to hide her true intentions, then what exactly is Arlecchino doing all of this for? If you listen to her lines in Winter Night's Lazo, while considering her inconsistencies in her personality and motives, as well as her references from the Commedia dell'Art, it seems like she's being sarcastic or satire when thinking about the children. The heavy emphasis on betrayal and turning everything to her own benefit, regardless of what happens, isn't just a mere hunch that we're based her off of here and it's been there for a long time she even mentions wearing many masks for different purposes for different goals in our short meeting with her and there's no telling when she might betray us or fontaine or nouvellette or literally everyone else in the future and that's not just because she's a harbinger of all things even piero has this to say about her in her drip marketing post fate grants favors to no one only those who would fight with every ounce of their being may earn their right to challenge it. Piero says this about Arlecchino. Something or someone that can challenge fate or even change fate with their own hands. Maybe a loom of fate. Think about that quote and try to reflect it on everything there is about Arlecchino, Harlequins, and the Zani. And also put into consideration her pyrovision, which is often theorized to signify a very headstrong or dedicated personality. Granted, it's still a theory based on previous characters, you can still see how passionate Arlecchino is with not only her care for the children of the hearth, but also whatever it is she's planning to achieve. A dedication to keep her true identity in check behind the curtains, or a passion to challenge her own fate, or maybe a strong will to keep herself alive and on top at all costs. Oh, and I also forgot to mention that Aizani, within the entirety of the Commedia dell'Art, has the strongest survival instinct and possesses an animistic view of the world, meaning they do anything and everything for them to survive, and they can also sense a spirit in everything, even the curse that Fosolor placed on Forina. So it's safe to say that Arlecchino knows about the remains of the Third Descender in the Gnosis, as well as Nuvolet's Hydro Dragon origins. Add to that, Arlecchino is the most successful Zani out of everyone in the Commedia, only being defeated and manipulated by her quote-unquote love interest, Colombina, in some place. Funnily enough, they're right next to each other as Harbingers, Arlecchino being the fourth and Colombina being number three, based on child. And within the Commedia dell'Art, there can be quite a few endings. And all of them don't end well. It's not a love story or a happy story with a happy ending. It's a comedy between professional artists. And oftentimes, nobody wins. So here's to seeing Colombina in 4.6 and doing something to Arlecchino in her story quest, I guess. But everything I've stated here about Arlecchino in Genshin, being as unhinged as Arlecchino from the Commedia, as well as references from religion and using an allegorical tale about Conria hasn't been shown. At least not yet. For all we know, Arlecchino might be hiding something very dark and sinister, and a simple trigger is needed for that to come out. And Columbina is a really good catalyst or fuse 
for that to happen. But that won't be about Arlecchino anymore, and that's also where I'll end this video. So as always, do the like, do subscribe, and hit the bell if you want to stay updated on my videos and want to listen to my new mic settings. Comment below, are there two Arlecchinos or am I just getting ahead of myself after making too many Twin Archon videos? Also, comment your thoughts on this new mic setting that I have. It's a bit better, I think, and more akin to my actual natural voice. I'm very excited if we'll get a new Harbinger introduced after properly getting to know Arlecchino in 4.6. But other than that, I'm just gonna use all my pulls on Arlecchino and putting her next to Farina. Life's good. Anyway, that's it from me. I'll see you guys in the next video, yeah? Like, out if you enjoyed, subscribe and hit the bell for more of my ramblings. And stay mad theorists. Bye!